the halt a tape. I'm lost, out of food, low on water, no sense of direction. Oh God. So ends the Holloway tape. Holloway leering into the camera, a backdrop of wall, final moments in a man's life. These are jarring pieces, coherent only in the way they trace Saint Glein. Oh, view. The opening card displays a quote from Gaston Bachelard's The Poetics of Space. The dreamer in his corner wrote off the world in a detailed daydream that destroyed, one by one, all the objects in the world. Note 289. Le rêveur dans son coin arrête le monde en une rêverie minutieuse qui détruit un à un tous les objets du monde. End note 289. There are 13 parts. They are separated by three seconds of white frame. In the upper right-hand corner, a number or word tracks the chronology, starting with first, continuing with two, th- twelve, and ending with last. The typeface is the same Janssen as issued by Anton Janssen in Leipzig between 1660 and 1687. These insertions were designed by Navidson. They, and in no way alter the original segments. Navidson reproduces Holloway's tape in its entirety. Who can forget Holloway's grizzled features as he earns the camera on himself? No comfort now. No hope of rescue or return. I deserve this. I brought this all on me. But I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, he says in part two. But what does that matter? I shot them. I shot both of them. Long pause. Half a canteen of water is all I've left. Another pause. Shouldn't have let them get away. Then I returned. Told everyone they lost. Lost. And with that last utterance, Holloway's eyes reveal who here is re- lost. Despite Holloway's undeniable guilt... Not since Floyd Collins became trapped in the Kentucky Sand Cave back in 1925 has there been such a terrible instance of suffering. Collins remained alive for 14 days and nights before he died. Despite the efforts of many men to free him from the squeeze, Collins never saw the light of day again. He only felt the ink, darkness, and cold in on him, bind him, kill him. All he could do was rave about angels and chariots and liver and onions and chicken sandwiches. Note 290. Zero. End note 290. Unlike Floyd Collins, no straitjacket of mud and rock holds Holloway. He can still move around, though where he moves leads nowhere. By the time he begins to videotape his final hours, he has already recognized the complete hopelessness of the situation. Repeating his identity seems the only mantra offers any consolation. Holloway Roberts, born in Thompson, bachelors from UMass, note 291. In the Epoch of Her Fear Mantras, Cambridge, Harvard, U.S., 1995, Alicia Hoyle discusses Holloway's lack of fear training. He did even put the ancient Hakkin Dak mantra, page 6. Earlier on, she provides a translation of this hunter's utterance, 26. I am not a fool, I wise. I will run from my fear. I will outdistance my fear. Then I will hide my fear. I will for my fear. I will let my fear run past. Then I will follow my fear. I will track fear until I approach in complete silence. I will strike my fear. I will, I will grab my fear. I will sink into my fear. And I will my fear. I will tear the th- of my fear. I will the neck of my fear. I will drink the blood of my fear. Gulp the flesh. Of my fear. I will crush bones. Of my fear. I will save it. I will swallow my fear all, and then I will digest fear until I can do nothing else but shit out my fear. In this way, I will be it strong. End note. Two nine one. It is almost as if he believes preserving his identity on videotape can somehow hold what he is powerless to prevent. Those endless contours of darkness stealing the whole 
from himself. I'm Holloway Roberts, he insists. Born in Menemone, um, bachelor's from UMass, explorer, professional hunter. With long pause. This is not right. It's not fair. I don't deserve to die. Regrettably, the limited amount of light, the quality of tape, not to mention the constant oscillation between sharp and blurry, complements of the Hi 8's automatic focus, barely your Holloway's bearded face that own anything else, not to imply that there exists an else, mainly a backdrop of darkness, which, as the police observed, could have in shot in any lightless room or closet. In other words, the amenity of Navidson's house eludes the frame. It exists only in Holloway's face, fear, etc. Deeper and deeper into his features, the cost of dying paid out with of flesh and breath. It is paint obvious the creature Holloway hunts has already begun to feed on him. Page 4, 6, 10, and center on Holloway's reiteration of his identity. Part 3, however, is different. It only lasts four seconds. With eyes wide open, voice hoarse, lips split and bleeding, Holt barks, I'm not alone. Part 5 follows up with, There's something here. I'm sure of it now. Part 8 with, It's following me. No, it's stalking me. And part 9, But it won't strike. It's just out there waiting. I don't know what for. But it's near now, waiting for me. Waiting for something. I don't know why it doesn't... Oh God, Holloway Roberts, Menominee, Wisconsin, chambering around in his rifle. Oh God. Note, two nine two, Colette Barnholt, American cinematographer, Burr two. Forty nine has argued that the existence of Part Twelve is an impossibility, claiming the framing and lighting, though only slightly different from earlier and later parts, indicate the presence of a recording device other than Holloway's. Joe Willis. Film comment, page 115, has pointed out that Barnholt's complaint concerns those prints released after 1990, apparently part 12 in all prints before, and after 1993, show a view consistent with the other 12. And yet, even though the spectre of digital manipulation has been raised in the Navidson record, to this day, no adequate explanation has managed to resolve the curious enigma concerning part 12. End note 292. It is interesting to compare Holloway's behaviour to Tom's. Tom addressed his gun with sarcasm, referring to as Mr. Monster while describing himself as unpalatable. Humour proved for a full psychological shield. Holloway has his rifle, but it proves the weaker of the two. Cold metal and gunpowder offer him little internal calm. Nevertheless, Of course, part 13, or rather last, of the Holloway tape initiates the largest and perhaps most popular debate surrounding the Navidson record. Lantern C. Pitch and Kadena Ash Becky stand on opposite ends of the spectrum, one favouring an actual monster, the other opting for a rational explanation. Neither one, however, succeeds in a definitive interpretation. Last spring, Pitch, in the Peleus Lecture series, announced... Of course there's a beast, and I assure you our belief or disbelief makes very little difference to that thing. Note 293. Also see Incarnation of Spirit Things, and by Lantern C. Pitch, New York, Respirine Press, 1996, for a look at the perils of disbelief. End note 293. In American Photo, May 1996, page 154, Kadena Ashbecki wrote... Death of light gives birth to creature darkness, few can accept as pure absence. Thus, despite rational objections, technology's failure is overrun by the onslaught of myth. Note 294. Also see Kadena Ashbecki, Myths Brood, The Nation, September 19... End note 294. Except the Vandal, known as Myth, always slaughters reason, if she falters. Myth is the tiger stalking the herd. Myth is Tom's, 
or a monster, myth is always beast, struck through text. Myth is the minotaur. Note 295. At the heart of the labyrinth waits the minotaur, and like the minotaur of myth, its name is... Chicklets treated the maze as trope for psychic concealment, its excavation resulting in tragic reconciliation. But if in Chicklet's eye the Minotaur was a son imprisoned by a father's shame, is there then to Navidson's eye an equivalent misprision of the in the depths of that place? And for that matter, does there exist a chance to reconcile the not known with the desire for its antithesis? As Kim Pale wrote, Navidson is not Minos. He did not build a labyrinth. He only t- it. the father of that place, be it a Minos, a Daedalus. St. Mark's God, another father who swore, Begone, relieve me from the sight of your detested form. A whole paternal line here following a tradition of dead sons vanished long ago, leaving the creek or within all the time in history to forget, to grow, to consume the consequences of its own terrible fate. And if there once was a time when a slate That time has long since passed. Love the lion, love the lion. But love alone does not make you Androcles, and for your stupidity, your head's crushed like a grape in its jaws. Note 296. Pale allusion to the ear. Note 297. See Kim Pale's Navidson and the Lion, Buzz, volume... Ver 1990. Pate also revisit traces of death. Note 298. Whether you've noticed or not, and if you have, well, bully for you, Zampano has attempted to systematically eradicate the Minotaur theme throughout the Navidson record. Big deal. Except while personally preventing said eradication, I discovered a particularly disturbing coincidence. Well, what did I expect? Serves me right, right? I mean, that's what you get for wanting to turn the Minotaur into a homie. No homie at all. End note 298. End note 297. End note 296. End note 295. End struck through text. Myth is Redwood. Note 299. See Appendix B. End note 299. And in Navidson's house, that faceless black. It many myths incarnate. Ce ne peut être que la fin du monde en avançant. Rambo dryly remarked. Suffice it to say, Holloway does not French for his end. Instead, he props up his EO camera, ignites a magnesium flare, and crosses the room to the far end, where he slumps in the corner to wait. Sometimes he mumbles itself, sometimes he screams obscenities. To the void. Bullshit. Bullshit. Just try and get me, you motherfucker. And then, as the minutes creak by, his energy dips. I don't want to die. This... Words coming out like a sigh, sad and lost. He lights another flare, tosses it toward the camera, then pushes the rifle against his chest and shoots himself. Jill Ramsey Peltilock wrote... In that place, the absence of an end finally became his own end. Note 300. Jill E. Locks No Kindness, St. November 21, 1993. End note 300. Unfortunately, Holloway is not entirely successful. For exactly two minutes and 28 seconds, he groans and twitches in his own blood until he slipped into shock and presumably death. Note 301. Quite a few people have speculated that Chad, thanks to the perverse acoustic properties of the house, probably heard Holloway commit suicide. See page 320. Struck through text. Consider Raphael Githa Savaggio's The Language of Torture, New York, St. Martin's Press, 1995, page 13, where he likens Chad's experience to those of Romans listening to Perilaus's devilish chamber. This unusual work of art was a life-sized replica of a bull cast in solid brass, hollowed out with a trapdoor in the back, through which victims were placed. 
A fire was then lit beneath the belly, slowly cooking anyone inside. A series of musical pipes in the bull's head translated the tortured screams into strange music. Supposedly, the tyrant Phalaris killed the inventor Perilaus by placing him inside his own creation. End note 301. Note 302. Can't help thinking of old man Z here, and those pipes in his head working overtime. Alchemist to his own secret anguish, lost in an art of suffering, though what exactly was the fire that burned him? As I strain now to see past the Navidson record, beyond this strange filigree of imperfection, the murmur of Zampano's thoughts, endlessly searching, reaching, but never quite concluding, barely even pausing, a ruin of pieces, gestures, and quests, a compulsion brought on by... Well, that's precisely it. When I look past it all, I only get an inkling of what tormented him. Though at least if the fire's invisible, the pain's not. Mortal and guttural, torn out of him day and night, week after week, month after month, until his throat's stripped and he can barely speak and he rarely sleeps. He tries to escape his invention but never succeeds, because for whatever reason, he is compelled day and night, week after week, month after month, to continue building the very thing responsible for his incarceration. Though, is that really right? I'm the one whose throat is stripped. I'm the one who hasn't spoken in days. And if I sleep, I don't know when anymore. A few hours drift by. I broke off to shuffle some feeling back into my knees and try to make sense of the image now stuck inside my head. It's been haunting me for a good hour now, and I still don't know what to make of it. I don't even know where it came from. Zampano is trapped, but where may surprise you. He's trapped inside me, and what's more, he's fading. I can hear him, just drifting off, consumed within, digested, I suppose, dying perhaps, though in a different way, which is to say, yes. Thou seest me not, old man, but I know thee well. Though I don't know who just said that. All of which is unfinished business, a distant moon to sense, and not particularly important, especially since his voice has gotten even fainter, still echoing in the chambers of my heart, sounding those eternal tones of grief, though no longer playing the pipes in my head. I can see myself clearly. I am in a black room, My belly is brass, and I am hollow. I am engulfed in flames, and suddenly very afraid. How am I so transformed? Where, I wonder, is the Phalaris responsible for lighting this fire now sweeping over my sides and around my shoulders? And if Sampano's gone, and I suddenly know in my heart he is very, very gone, why does strange music continue to fill that black room. How is it possible the pipes in my head are still playing? And who do they play for? End note 302. End note 301. Then, for 46 seconds, the um, reveals nothing else but his still body. Nearly a minute of silence In fact, the length is so absurd, it almost appears as if Navidson forgot to trim this section. After all, there is nothing more to be gained from this scene. Holloway is dead, which is back when it happens. The whole thing clocks in under two seconds. Fingers of blackness slash across the lighted wall and consume Holloway. And even if loses sight of everything, the tape still records that terrible growl, this time without a doubt, in the room. Was it an actual critter? Note 303, struck through text. Creature is admittedly a pretty clumsy description, offspring of the Greek koros, meaning surfeit. The implication of fullness provides a misleading impression of the mind... Her. In fact, all references to this minotaur self must be viewed as purely representative. Obviously, what Holloway encounters here is pointedly not half man, half bull, something other, forever inhabiting, unreadable, granting undeserved ontological benefits. 
as John Hollander. It would annihilate us all to see the huge shape of our being mercifully offers us issue and oblivion, thus echoing one more time, though not for the last time. Endlessly, in an ever unfolding and yet never opening sequence, lost on stone trails. And note 303. Or just the flare sputtering out. And what about the sound? Was it made by a beat or just an, a reconfiguration of that absurd place? Like the Kumbu Icefall, product of um, peculiar physics. It seems erroneous to assert, like pitch, that this creature had actual teeth and claws, which myth, for some reason, requires to have claws. They were made of shadow, and if it did have teeth, they were made of darkness. Yet even as such, the still stalked hallway at every corner, until at last it did strike, devouring him, even roaring. The last thing heard, the sound of Holloway ripped out of existence.